Hello there. This is the third video that I've done, and it'll turn out to be a three-part series, so this is the last one. And this is around the BigMe B251 all-in-one PC. So the first video was kind of an unboxing, a setup. The last video was really focused on the aspects of the monitor, both in terms of the different settings, as well as how it looks under different refresh modes. This video is really more about the all-in-one PC. So we're gonna look into the specifications of the PC, uh, its benchmarking, look at a couple, uh, not necessarily comparisons, but similar products out there, just to kind of put a sense of how the specs compare. Um, and then we'll go into some applications, like we'll walk through some samples of Microsoft Office in Action, Excel, Word, and PowerPoint. Um, we'll play a little bit of music, play a little game, um, and that will kind of conclude w then with my overall thoughts about this device as a PC. So I'll give the pros and cons about that. After that, we'll go into what I think is actually the most intriguing use for this device. And so we'll kind of show a demonstration of that and I'll share my thoughts on that and then we'll wrap it up. Just one quick note before we get into it. In the previous video, I spent most of the time filming the uh, monitor with no front lighting, and we just used the, the lighting from an LED, um, you know, torture to, uh, if that's a word, to um, light up the screen. And I think that's because, you know, the screen does better with, with you know, outside lighting. However, uh, filming for the PC, I found that kind of the ambient lighting I was getting in the room made it a little difficult and darker to see the screen. So I turned on front lighting, even though that's not the optimal way to view. And that way you get a nice consistent image um, and can see the details on the screen. So this video will feature front lighting where the last video was predominantly uh, without the front lighting. So just one little notation there. Anyway, let's go ahead and get on in. So we're going to start by looking at the specifications of this PC. And to do that, we're going to go into Task Manager and take a look at the different components as measured by Windows. So we're going to go ahead and go here. And I'm going to go ahead and switch this to text mode. And that way we can see uh, with more precision um, the, the the writing. So we'll start off the, um, actually let's start off with the CPU. The CPU is a 12th gen Intel Core i5 1235U. Uh, it comes with 16 gigabytes of memory as you can see there. It does have a solid state disk. This is a one terabyte solid state disk. And then finally as we just saw in the beginning the GPU is an Intel Iris ZE graphics. It's an integrated graphics card with about eight gigabytes of memory. Uh, integrated graphics are fine. They've come a long way, but they're also very limiting. And we'll see that in certain, some of the specifications we run that the gaming component of this PC is very lacking even before we start considering the screen itself. Um, and it's because of the graphics card or the use of, of an integrated graphics card. Having said that, um, it's not necessarily a problem that this computer has an integrated graphics card. It's perfectly acceptable for a home office PC. Okay, to kind of compare the specifications of this computer to a couple others, and we won't call these comparable computers, but you know, good data points to take a look at. I've gone to PC Mag, which is one of, I think, one of the best review sites for tech. And we're in their top all-in-one computers for 2024. And we've got this pop-up ad, which we're gonna get rid of. And basically, let's call our attention to two computers in particular. The first is the best uh, all-in-one desktop for most users. So we'll see how those internals compare to this particular device. And then we'll look at the best budget all-in-one. You'll notice the price for their recommended model is 900, and their price for the budget all-in-one it's about 430. So let's start here with their top pick. Okay, I'm just going to interject here real quick because in the original filming, I actually came across the wrong specifications for the all-in-one PC that PC Mag recommends. 
Um, these are the actual specifications I should have read off. It has an i5, different i5 processor, um, but also same amount of RAM, same amount of storage. Um, it's a 24 inch uh, compared, of course, to the Big Me, which is a 25 inch. It is a touch screen, so that's, that's a critical difference. Um, but it actually has the same integrated graphics card. So the specifications are not identical, um, but the, uh, the Big Me 251s, for the most part, is really close to the specifications of this top rated um, uh, all-in-one PC. So in, in the end, we're gonna about to go into kind of the more budget um, uh, recommendation from PC Mag. Um, the, the metrics of the Big Me are really between the two, but arguably a little bit closer to this uh, particular recommended model. All right, back into the video. Let's go ahead and take a look at the specifications of uh, their favorite budget. Here we go. But the idea here is that the, um, the components of this particular PC are pretty comparable with some of the more um, higher rated computers here on PC Mag. So um, that actually bodes well for the capabilities of this device, at least generally speaking. But let's dig just a little bit deeper into the actual measurements of the performance of this machine. So to measure the performance of the internals of this PC, I went to a website called userbenchmark.com and ran an application and the results are here on the screen. And you can see they basically, uh, at the highest level, do measurements in three broad categories, which is to say, you know, gaming, uh, desktop, which is also uh, comparable to kind of work or home office, and then finally workstation. And this is where you're into really heavy uh, load things like computer aided design, like um, high uh, resolution video editing and stuff like that. And the performance is what you'd expect. The internals are very consistent with a home office PC and it's very strong in that regard. And it's weak in both gaming and in the workstation. And that's pretty much as we'd expect. And if you look at the details down below, I mean, it really does ultimately come down to the graphics processor. It's happy with the processor, the RAM, and the boot drive. It's the graphics card, the integrated graphics card, which is kind of weighing it down on some of these other categories. But it's what we would expect. You don't expect to have a, a high-level graphics card in an all-in-one. Um, I believe there are some all-in-ones that do have higher-end graphics cards, but it's not the norm. For this type of PC, this is quite reasonable. Just to go a little bit into the gory details, for those of you who are interested, um, here are the specific benchmark results. They liked uh, the CPU under normal mode, but not as much under heavy or what they call server mode. Uh, the graphics card they didn't particularly care for. They called it very poor overall. The SSD drive, they actually thought it did quite well in their three predominant measurements. Um, and then finally, uh, the RAM did fairly well, both in single and multi-core, but not in terms of its latency. But again, for this type of a computer, that's perfectly acceptable. So that's this particular benchmarking. Now, we know that gaming is not going to be something that you're going to want to do on this device, at least any type of sophisticated gaming. Uh, but just for fun, I went to another benchmarking site, which is called Can I Run It? And here are the results of that. So in terms of all the games in their database, um, this computer can run about one out of five of those games at the minimum uh, specifications. And then it can only do about one out of 20 games in terms of recommended specifications. Now, a huge caveat to this. W these measurements are based on the internals of the device. They don't know when they're running these benchmarking anything about the screen. And none of these games are optimized for an e-ink screen. So even though you can run some of these games um, in minimum or and occasionally on recommended specifications, uh, that doesn't mean it's going to run well or look good on this type of a screen. So really, you know, is it possible to play games? I mean, technically it's possible, and there's some games we can play. We'll look at Solitaire just as an example a little bit later. But generally speaking, you just would not buy this game to run um, 
you know, to, you wouldn't buy this to play games. Let me just go ahead and click on what they think we can run. And again, this is uh, not considering the uh, the screen, but they like uh, they like League of Legends, oddly enough, on recommended. Uh, they like Lost in the Forest. Um, I think that's lining up with Kanishi. Um, so in the top 100 games, at least according to their site, there's about three that can run on recommended, but buyer beware, who knows how well they would actually run on this type of screen. So we know that gaming is not a focus of this type of machine, but office work is. So I thought we'd spend a little bit of time looking at uh, Excel, Word, and PowerPoint. Just a quick brief glimpse of how they operate. I'll re remind viewers that in the previous video where I reviewed this device as a monitor, we went through the different modes um, that you can cycle through, the refresh modes, which very much have an impact on performance. Um, so I, and I've set these modes up slightly differently too with different levels of contrast. So for example, if we go into web mode, so I have the contrast set quite low on that version. Um, I can then go into video mode. And it's a little bit darker because I set the contrast a little bit higher on that. If I go into text mode, you can see the contrast went up significantly. In fact, this is the highest level of contrast. Um, but what you give away from that is uh, the smoothness of the pointer. So this, the pointer is the most smooth on web and video mode. Uh, it's a little bit slower on text mode, uh, and it's virtually uh, unusable in image mode. You can see everything looks great there, but uh, the cursor is very choppy. So we're going to go ahead and go into video mode, uh, which gives a little bit of contrast, um, but it also has a much smoother mouse, as you can see there. And we'll use that mode for these demonstrations. So what you're looking at here is actually an Excel file I put together a number of years ago. I used to have a website that I kept um, and I put just a bunch of miscellaneous stuff on there and this is one of them uh, just for uh, for the geeks out there uh, and I include myself in that. Um, this is a database actually of transformer stats. So transformers are a popular toy line that began in the 1980s. Uh, and still, of course, continues through, particularly through the Michael Bay movies. Um, but in the 80s, uh, there was a team up between the makers of the Transformers and Marvel. They actually hired a couple Marvel writers who wrote up uh, little descriptions of each of the toys and had stats that went along with it. So what I did, um, for some reason, is I created this uh, Excel file which contained uh, all the stats and you have all sorts of ways you can filter the information. And I'm just going to use it here as an example of what it looks like to work in Excel. So you can see there's plenty, you know, you can use drop down bars like you would in, in any other version of Excel. And here I've selected blast off as the character and you can see that particular character stats. I can use a macro. So I just cleared the entries like so. I can click on this detail tab and I can see, you know, all sorts of transformers in this case, because there's no filters. You know, I'm seeing basically the uh, most powerful transformers just in terms of their stats. Um, but this is a good example. I mean, you can see how responsive that this is. You can see that the colors, while grainy, still add a lot to the experience. Um, and Excel actually works quite well um, on this device and on this screen. A further example, uh, also another kind of geeky example of transformers, is I took the same statistics and created a battle simulator, which is right here. And this is basically a simulator. Let's go ahead and clear those results. Where you can take one transformer, I'm going to go ahead and clear the screen, and compete against another. So in this case, I have Bumblebee, and then they're facing Megatron. And you can see this is another way of looking at their stats. You know, when when one auto when one robot has a higher stat level than the other, they get the green circle. A lower is the red diamond and a tie is a, the yellow diamond. But what I'm going to do is I've created this macro where I simulate battles between the two. And we're just going to simulate 100 fights real quick and see what those results are. It 
it's going through the macro, and there we go. So Megatron, in this case, would win 98 times out of 100. Um, but there's a great example of how well the device can kind of handle uh, a fairly basic macro, but, but still there's a lot of formulas that are going on in the background, and it's all handled just fine here. Uh, going over to Word, I've got my notes here for um, um, you know this video. I've also got this grid that I put together, and uh, of course I've made this huge. We're at a, a large magnification, so it's filling the entire screen, but um, definitely very legible. These happen to be all the verbal commands that the monitor will accept. And I did a typing example and a little more, um, you know, showing the different modes and how those uh, handled in Word. So I think that's pretty well documented in the other video. So I won't do that here, but you know, Word obviously works quite well. And then just going over to PowerPoint, this is a, a PowerPoint I kind of unearthed back to my grad school days. And I won't go through the whole thing, but let's kind of go through, I will refresh the screen. And we'll just go through a few slides here. This was a uh, project that we did in marketing, and we looked at um, how you know what kind of product that we wanted to create, and making a marketing plan around that. In this case, we created a cat blanket that was disposable. So the idea was that you'd lay it out, cats would lie on it, and instead of that hair going into their your, your bed, your chairs, and so on. Um, I see we misspelled Ottomans there. Um, then you could just dispose of these these sheets. Um, and you know, here we talk about current solutions not working, and then our cat blanket is the answer. So you can see that you know PowerPoint works perfectly fine here. Yes, with ghosting, uh, ghosting is ever present. You can always get rid of it at a tap of a button. Um, but for the most part, it's a question of whether you can tolerate the ghosting or not. Um, and I find it's minimal enough that it is tolerable for office work. So it is, um, it is effective as long as you're not bothered by the ghosting. All right, so I'm here in Spotify now, and um, you know the internal speakers for this uh, PC are terrible. In fact, let me take them off mute for a second. I don't know if you can hear that, but there's this kind of this background kind of hiss coming out, um, and even though there's no sound coming out of the speakers currently, um, and there was a little bit of popping noise when we turned it on as well, the speakers are just awful. But what I want to show real quickly, go ahead and put that back on mute, is that it is easy to connect a, um, a Bluetooth speaker, and in fact I have one connected already, and the sound is perfectly fine, so I'm just going to play a little bit of a song. Let's go ahead and uh, we'll do this BoJack Horseman. And uh, we'll play a little bit of the theme. All right, I didn't want to play too much of that. Um, but the point is just that the Bluetooth works really well, um, and I've been using Bluetooth um, on some of the peripherals as well, the mouse and the keyboard. Actually, um, I, I use Bluetooth a little bit. I've mostly been using it via dongles that are connected to the back of the monitor, um, but the Bluetooth definitely can work for those as well, and that's just an example of that in action. So again, despite the fact that you really wouldn't want to do much in the way of gaming, I just want to show that you could do some of the most simple games. And we'll go ahead and click on Solitaire real quickly. And we'll just go ahead and get past this menu. There we go. Do a little bit of Klondike. And just start a new game. All right, well, now that we're past that horrendous ad, we'll just play a couple. Oops, move this king over 
here. You can see it works relatively well. It can handle this kind of, the graphics look pretty decent. And this isn't even in the highest mode, but still doable. I still prefer the smoother experience of say like a web mode. There we go. Which actually looks pretty good. Let's refresh the screen. So anyway, it's doable, just not recommended. All right, so it's time to go over the pros and cons of this device. And we'll start with the pro. Whole, solid home office computer, really good specs for that purpose, uh, including the processor, RAM, and, and general storage with its solid state drive. All that is, is quite good, um, but it comes at a massive cost. You know, at $2,000, that's you know, twice the cost of PC mags recommended all in one. And that one also includes a touchscreen, the Big Me B251 does not have touchscreen capability. So, you know, cost is definitely a concern here. And at 2000, it's just flat out expensive objectively. Also, you know, yes, a great home office computer, but if you're talking about doing any type of picture or video editing or most games, it's not the device for you. Um, either it won't work because of uh, not having a dedicated graphics card or it won't work because of the limitations of the e-ink screen. The device does run Windows, that's a strength that allows for a lot of flexibility in terms of how to use the device. But there's no apparent way of updating the monitor software itself. So the monitor has no way that I could see of updating firmware um, either manually or through any type of Wi-Fi. So the monitor doesn't appear to have any ability to improve. So your Windows is going to update, but your monitor itself will not. Lots of ports on the device, lots of USB ports, a lot of connections, actually quite good in terms of ports. But no Ethernet or aux jack, so you're going to be connecting the internet via Wi-Fi and Bluetooth which isn't terrible. Um, it, it does uh, do both of those fairly well, but it, you know, it, connecting to an ethernet does usually deliver a faster internet performance and some people prefer an aux jack for their audio. Those options aren't available here. The monitor stand is solid and it's flexible. It's really nice. Um, they did a good job with the monitor stand. The screen includes ghosting. This is well known an issue for Kaleido 3. It's certainly the case here. And I don't think the ghosting is terrible, but it's ever present. And you know, people's tolerance for ghosting varies a lot. And ghosting, again, if you're not aware, is when the screen retains a previous image, a faint outline of a previous image. Um, and Kaleido 3 tends to have a lot of ghosting. Um, and people's tolerance for ghosting varies. I'm quite tolerant of it, actually. Um, but regardless of your tolerance, it is ever present and it's not a good thing. So it's listed here as a con. The voice controls are useful in changing modes. Um, I found that quite handy. On the other hand, you do have accidental trigger of voice commands, which was really annoying. And it did happen a couple times a day. The remote works really well, so no complaints there. Do wish that there was a refresh button on the remote. That's a little bit missing. Um, but otherwise, it had you know good range and um, I didn't have to point directly at the monitor to get it to work, so I appreciated that. The front lighting is okay. Um, it's, it's generally pretty even, um, but the natural lighting definitely makes uh, the screen look better. Um, so if you're in a situation where you, you've got you know, poor lighting or dark lighting, uh, in wherever you're using the device, you're going to have to rely on front or lighting, and that does kind of weaken um, you know, how the screen appears. The mouse is nothing, you know, nothing really to write home about, but it's solid, and I have no complaints about the mouse. I thought the mouse was totally fine, um, and uh, it worked great. The keyboard is terrible. Now, I do want to point out, um, I did make a mistake in the first video, and I had mentioned that the keyboard was a Bluetooth keyboard and it was a mistake to package it because uh, you couldn't use it in Bluetooth mode when you were booting up the PC. You had to be able to connect 
manually or via dongle um, and I wasn't clear how to do that with the keyboard and I just didn't think it through. So that was a mistake on my part because they do provide a USB-C to USB-C cable. There are USB-C ports on this, there's two of them. Um, and the keyboard has a USB-C port for charging. So I, I could have connected that manually and solved for that issue. So that was on me, but that doesn't escape the fact that the keyboard is terrible. It's, it's, a, it's nice in the sense that it's very minimal, lightweight and easy to store. But other than that, I would never, I didn't even try typing on the keyboard other than just to get an initial feel um, because it's not a good keyboard at all. Um, the monitor does work well with external speakers, um, so that was great. However, the fact is you have to use external speakers because the internal speakers are terrible, absolutely terrible. And they make noise when they're not muted, um, which I don't think the microphone picked up in the video, um, but it's definitely a hum I could have done without. It's clearly one of the weakest hardware components it are the internal speakers. You know, image mode gives really good results. I was um, really impressed by how things looked in image mode. But the problem is that, you know, the responsiveness of the screen makes image mode really impractical unless you're only displaying images. Um, so if you're trying to move your mouse, or you're trying to interact with the device, uh, you really can't use image mode, but that's the mode you want to use because it's by far the best of the four modes. And it actually gets rid of virtually all of the pixelation in the color uh, images. So, you know, it's just a real shame that you couldn't marry the quality of that mode um, with the responsiveness of some of the other modes. A uh, monitor wasn't too heavy for its size. Actually, it was quite light, I would say, um, and not in a terrible way either. I thought um, that was definitely a pro worth calling out. It was easy to mount onto the stand, um, easy to move around. Uh, so I like that. Okay, so that's my overall thoughts about the Big Me B251, the good and the bad. You know, my overall assessment, and I think it might be obvious, is that, you know, for use as a, a home office PC, even though it has the specifications to do that type of work, you know, an e-ink screen just isn't ideal for that purpose. And I can tell you that at the end of filming, and I put everything away, uh, having used this all-in-one PC as my primary computer for almost a week, um, I went back to my normal computer and, you know, it, it, I was surprised and reminded by how quick and uh, responsive an LCD screen is. And it's, you know, there are some compromises for sure when you go down to an e-ink screen. And for me personally, it's not particularly worth it. Now, um, for some people, you know, using an e-ink screen as a secondary monitor, uh, where you've got it situated in such a way where it's, you know, makes it easy to read things, you know, that might be a use case for some folks. Um, but definitely as an all-in-one PC, I don't, I don't think the use case is there. However, when I purchased this device, and I did it predominantly to do video reviews and just to, to check it out, but I did have another uh, thought in mind, and that was, well, could this potentially be used as a display for art and photographs? And I was actually pretty happily surprised as the results. Now, I didn't ultimately decide to go that route, but it was very close. So I'm gonna do a demonstration now. We're gonna walk through and show what I had planned for it and how that would have looked. And then I'll give my final thoughts about that at the end, including what I think this means in terms of the best use case application for this device. So let's take a look. So one interesting use case um, for this uh, device is how it can display photos and art, and I'll show an example of that in action. We have this application, um, which you can see down below, called PictureFlect Photo Viewer. I'm gonna go ahead and bring it up, and I've already selected some files um, that I have downloaded onto the computer, and these are mainly uh, classical works of art that I've taken uh, from the internet, and then there'll be some photographs. And we're gonna go ahead and go into the highest uh, image mode, which is called image mode, there you go. And uh, we'll go ahead and play it and uh, take a look and see how that looks. Now this particular application does allow you to change the rate in which you're changing images. In this case, it's every five seconds. 
and it's also refreshing the screen every time it's changing so you don't get much ghosting at all particularly in the image a little bit maybe in some of the black bars um, but not in, not necessarily in the image itself uh, of course you can again change that length so you can have you know a slower or faster change of slides you can also have it completely rotate uh, so it's constantly uh, cycling through um, there's a, a bunch a whole bunch of settings that are behind this So we're almost through with the classical artwork. And now we've moved in some photographs. You can see using this mode, you know, the, the pictures actually look pretty good. It also works because it's more of a still image. So we don't have to worry about moving elements on the screen except for the transitions. So for Kaleido 3, this is really good color representation. We know that Kaleido 3 is, is inherently limited to about 4,000 colors, but it's an amazing job despite that. And there you go, we've run full circle. So with that, that this brings us to the end of this video and asking the ultimate question of who is this device for? Who might want to consider the Big Me B251 all-in-one PC. And I think there is an interesting use case based on what we just saw. As I noted earlier, I don't think this is really good as a home office PC because I think an LCD monitor is better. Um, I don't think you necessarily need uh, an all-in-one PC if you are trying to work with a screen where you can do reading that's a little easier on the eyes perhaps, just a standalone monitor. A, a two-setup monitor would be good for that, or one's a normal screen LCD and the other is the e-ink screen. So, so what's the market then for this device? And I think we just saw a great example of what that potential is. You know, I always say about e-ink, there's three areas that e-ink really excels, right? So there's there's reading, you think of e-readers, there's writing, you know, note-taking devices like Remarkable, Supernote, books, etc. And then there's the third one, which is signage. E-Ink really excels at signage just as it excels in reading and writing. And that's where I think there is an interesting use case here. Now, I mentioned earlier that I ultimately decided not to use this device um, as a way to display art in my home. But the reason why I made that decision wasn't because I didn't think the images looked very good, because I actually thought they looked pretty good when they were in image mode. It was just that the only place that I could place the device, the only place I had wall space that was near an outlet, was in my master bedroom, very close to where I go to sleep. And the concern I had was the monitor gave off a little bit of noise. It's not particularly notable as PCs go, but it certainly wasn't quiet. And I just didn't think that that was the right environment to put something like that in and so ultimately I ended up packing up this device and not using it at all but if i were considering doing something like that use case in say a small business where i'm displaying a menu or i'm displaying maybe you know certain things like you know tuesday is going to be taco night or um, if I'm you know, putting up art or, you know, in that environment where there's a little bit of a din, you're never going to notice the sounds coming from the computer. It's just going to disappear. But you are going to get the advantages of seeing images in high resolution. And this is where this device actually is a little bit cool because now you've got a totally integrated PC. So if you wanted to change, for example, the things that you're showing on the screen, you could you know, create something on your own personal computer, you know, use something like OneDrive or Google Drive to move those files over to the BigMe device, and then pretty quickly select those if you want to use a slideshow like I did in the example, or whatever it is that you're using to display the information, because you have options because it's a home office PC, it kind of starts to make sense. 
Furthermore, you know, small businesses have a little bit more money. I know a lot of small businesses run on a very tight budget, but their budgets tend to be greater than that of individuals. And I think $2,000 to display information, if it can be done in a useful way or fit within the decor of that business, you know, that might make sense. And again, it plays to the strength of e-ink. Maybe you've got a lot of sunlight and LCD screens tend to wash out. Well, this screen wouldn't have that issue. So things like that. I think that's the biggest and best use case for this. Not in the home, uh, not in the office, but in small businesses that are displaying information. The only limitation I can see with that is that the screen itself is only 25 inches. So it has to be the type of thing that you're pretty much on top of, especially if you're reading material. If you're just showing, you know, uh, quick information, then that, that can be done further away. Um, but that's the only limitation I can think of in terms of its use as signage. In fact, I'll even go further. You know, I talked in the pros and cons about how terrible the keyboard was, but it actually makes more sense in that context because you just need something real quick to interact and set up your display and you can stow it away. And it's a nice, very thin keyboard for that one specific purpose. Um, so there, even the one of the weaknesses of the Big Me, which is the keyboard they provide, isn't as big of a weakness in the context of using this in a small business. Anyway, that's my two cents. If you can think of other use cases that might be just as good, if not better, please put those in the comments below. But that will conclude my review of the Big Me B251. We've covered it pretty extensively from setup to the monitor to the PC. Um, and I think that you should at this point have a really good sense of what this product is, what it can do and what it can't do. Um, but if you have any questions, please put those in the comments as well, and I'll be sure to reply to the best that I can. Thank you very much, and have a great day.